ever met a man so wise and yet so humble, uh, so powerful but yet so giving, uh, for him to, to, to seek me out and to sit down and counsel with me was heartwarming for me. And, and I really do appreciate the love that he has, and you rarely see that in a man, especially a Christian man, because sometimes we get so tired of what we're doing that we don't understand who we're doing it to. And we forget that we're supposed to be loving and feeding these sheep and not poking them around and everything. I, I also want to say that this conversation, this speech, this lecture is dedicated to the loving memory of my grandfather, Dr. Milford Vaughn of St. Louis, whose little girl sits here in the front row here, my mother, uh, who grew up and chose a man to become my father the Reverend Waverly Weaver Jr., who also sits in the front row. And, and I appreciate the kind of leadership that this man has given me. Stand up, Pop. Let me, this is my Pop here. This is my Pop here. You know, my Pop. Because, see, you see, folks, as a young man, I rebelled. As I'm sure I'm the only one who's done this. And I don't think I've ever apologized for Pop for, for giving him such a hard time as a young child. Actually, Pop, I, I know it didn't bother you much because you made sure it bothered me much. <laughs> and, and, and I appreciate the leadership, Bob. Thank you very much. You know, because, because ladies, I want to tell you something. I want to tell you something. The greatest gift you can give your children, the greatest honor you can provide for your family is your choice of who their father is going to be. I think it's time we start choosing men to be fathers, not, not these, these pretty broke dudes, not these folks who, you know, because I mean, what happens is you get these pretty broke guys, you're making babies, then you go look for nice men to raise them. It's just time, folks. It's time that we understand that the beginning of the family is your choice and a mate. And I want to introduce you all now to my choice, my lovely wife, the world's most beautiful woman, Brenda. You know, because my wife is my greatest motivator. She, you know, your woman is in charge of, of your emotions. Uh, she knows days ahead of time what kind of weekend I'm going to have. <laughs> she's, in she's in charge of that. We, you, know, you know, what happens, folks, is that we get so caught up in all who we are and what we're doing and what we're trying to do that we cannot focus on what we should be doing. And, and I realized as a young man, you know, by looking at my father, who I saw every day and working every day, I realized that, that a man, the, the wealth of a man, is how he worships his God. You see, your father is your example of how a man protects his family, how a man honors his God, how a man loves his woman, how he raises his children, he, he gives you the example of manhood. And you will, good or bad, continue on that example. And so when I, when I grew up, I realized that how I treated my wife, how I understood and raised my family, how I protected my community was part of my worship to my God. It has to be. Because you see, as the pastor was saying last night, he's going to continue on today, he talked about Adam and Eve in the garden. And folks, you know, God looked at man and decided that it was not good for us to be alone. Uh, he didn't say it wasn't good for women to be alone. <laughs> my, my mother, I'm going to embarrass my mom for a second. My mother has raised seven grown men. And we're all BMWs. There's black men working. And uh, she has put in our hearts this fear, this certain fear. She said, now don't forget, boy, it takes a heck of a man to beat no man at all. Got to be a heck of a man. So when, when Adam, you know, God looked at Adam and said, it's not good for man to be alone. So for his own good, for his own good, I'm going to, I'm going to give him a little something. something. I'm, I'm going to put a little something aside for him. For his own good. He formed Eve for the good of man. And then he presented Eve to Adam. 
Now, I know, I see you, brother, out here looking sharp, looking good. I know that you probably, some of you think that you are God's gift to women. <laughs> and, and I hate to disappoint you, but in reality, women is God's gift to man. And, and how, you, how you take care of her, protect her, honor her, provide for her is part of your worship to God. It is your thank you to God. It is how you say thank you for this gift. I woke up this morning when my wife walked up and got me a cup of coffee and sat there by the bed and looked at her and said, good job, God. Good job. This is for me. My God loves me, folks. We have to understand our job, our commitment, because the family is under attack. You heard it from his pulpit. You heard the bishop say he has spoken to a dynamic person who has proclaimed the devil's intent to destroy the woman and destroy the family. That's his intent. I don't care about his intent. I care about your intent. Whether you're going to bring God into your home and put that angel before you, between you and Satan, and raise your children to honor God and fear God instead of honoring man and fearing man. we got to get back to that, folks, because when I was a young man, I left. Folks, I ran far from God as I could go. I left this man's home and went as far west as I can go without getting wet. I escaped Missouri, went to California, and, and got out there with all those crazy people. I'm from the land of... Uh, milk and honey, also the land of fruits and nuts. <laughs> and I joined the military, and I was, I, was, I was out there on my own, away from home, away from dad, away from pop, who all wise, all seen, all knowing, couldn't get away from anything. And I got out there, boy, and got with some crazy folks who started challenging my God. Now, thanks to my father, I knew enough about God to know they were crazy. But they began to ask me about my personal beliefs, and I began to tell him about the walk I saw with my father and grandfather. But eventually, I got involved with a crowd of haters. They were haters. And then on August the uh, 11th, 1971, on board the USS Gompers in San Diego, California, a angry hater, a man who hated me, dropped a ton and a half of steel on me uh, on purpose trying to kill me, trying to take my life. He did it out of hatred for the color of my skin. And this is not a black and white thing because I also hated him for the color of his skin. You know, because he was a white racist and I was a black racist. The only difference between us two is that I did not think he was my enemy. I thought he was maybe my competitor. And, and I was pretty good verbally, so we would have all, you know, every day at lunchtime we would meet with our little crowds of white racists and black racists and we have little debates on things. I was pretty good at beating him up verbally. And I didn't know that, um, he hated me. See, I've been to Vietnam, and I knew an enemy. An enemy, folks, you don't turn your back on. An enemy, you try to neutralize and destroy and beat up until he either dies or stops being your enemy. No compromise. You know, I went to Vietnam, and the captain told me that, you know, my first patrol told me that we don't shoot first. I beg your pardon? <laughs> the, the policy of the United States Navy is that we only return fire. I said, let me tell you my mama's policy. <laughs> Come home, boy. <laughs> no, we don't play. I don't. This is my enemy. I, you mean I see a seven, some 12-year-old kid in black pajamas aiming an AK-47 at me? I'm supposed to wait to the muzzle flame? That was crazy. For, I came home. But I went to Vietnam and got back and got back safe. Went to San Diego and turned my back on my real enemy. And I turned back and looked at him as he released 2,800 pounds of steel and black iron and metal on me. It crushed me on the hip. I turned around away and it crushed me on the hip and knocked me against that, that steel wall and crushed my ribs and hit my head against the wall and crushed my steel helmet in and broke my, my pelvis and ruptured things. And, and, and I'm sitting there in one instant, a 21-year-old strong athletic man, highly skilled, highly trained, and in one second, I was hopeless and useless. I would never weld again never fabricate metal again, never earn a living at something I've been training four years to do, and in one second, I was useless. I could not even speak. The vibrations in my voice, the vibrations in my voice hurt my back. Laying in the hospital bed at Balboa Hospital, I knew the bus schedule because every time that doggone bus took off, the vibrations hurt my back. 
I was in immense pain. I was, I, I was helpless. I was hopeless. I had nowhere to turn, nobody to turn to. I can understand anything but anger and frustration. I wanted more than anything else to take this man's life. I want you to know my holy goal in life was to put my hands around his throat and make his eyeballs pop out. That was my goal, folks. And I, when, I, when I finally got out of the hospital, because, see, I had a praying mother. Trust me, folks, I want to pray for myself. Trust me. They gave me a week to live. I got it. It's been a good week. We're having a great time here. I got out of the hospital. They said, finally, when I got out of intensive care, they said that you're going to be in the hospital for one year and in bed for eight, nine months. And I walked out in three months. You see, you see, you don't have to tell me about a miracle working God. Uh, you don't have to tell me about a, a life saving God. Uh, I went out and I went into the military. I went to, a, to, to school with the Berkeley and Merritt College where the Black Panther Party was started and got into this black militancy because, see, I hated, I hated white people because this one white guy tried to kill me. Does that make sense to you? That's logical. Eight white guys rescued me, but that's, you know. Don't let the facts get in the way here now, folks. <laughs> Don't let the facts. My doctor was white. My nurse was white. But we ain't going to worry about that right now. I got to hate this guy. And I hate all white folks behind this one white guy. And I'm full of hate and anger going to school and with all these militants and, and uh, learning Swahili and, and black history. I got a degree in black history and political science. And, and I ran with some tough characters, folks. And in the midst of all of this, of all this hatred, I kept having this nagging, empty feeling in my heart. You know, this nagging, something wasn't, I knew it wasn't right. You know, it was, it was nice, it was cool. You know, you was a good, you know, the girls liked you and it was all right, you know, do your thing. But it, it was hollow. And I started looking for God. Everybody has a God. You know that? If you're looking for a God, folks, everyone has one for you. They got some cool gods out there, too. You can do all kinds of things. You can visualize world peace. You can, you, can, you can call up the little girl on TV with the cards and with a fake Jamaican accent. Oh, yeah, you know. You know it's fake, don't you? I hope you don't think it's real. <laughs> you, know, you, can, you can go out there, man, and you can, you can do the, the tarot cards and the, and the, and the Chinese, ancient, ancient Chinese history. I mean, folks, in the bottom of all this, looking for all this, I had to look at this, this Christian stuff. I was raised that way. And I found all kinds of reasons not to fool with Christians. The devil told me, pointed out all kinds of reasons. I was, I, I was raised in my grandfather's parsonage, so I saw all the preachers all during the week, the good and the bad, but I remembered the bad. I remember my grandfather counseling them on their little activities with the church choir director. We don't talk about that. I'm, I'm a little kid. I'm hearing this stuff. I'm thinking all oh, these phony fake preachers. I don't need these people around my life. Let me get them out here. And then I remember my father, and I, I remember things he was doing, and, and you know what? It, it came up to two men. I knew of two men in my life that actually believe this Jesus stuff. You know, I mean, I am a black militant. I have my dashiki, I got my afro, I walk around with my attitude, you know, I'm speaking Swahili, but I'm still in, in the bottom of my heart. I know of two men that I know believe this Jesus stuff. You know, it's amazing that, that the two wisest men I know, my grandfather and my father, the two wisest men I know, the most level-headed men I know, the most calm, cool, collective, intellectual men I know really, really, really honestly believed that a grown man died and came out the grave alive. Can you imagine that? I mean, I was shocked. They actually, and I knew they believed this, folks, because you see, I lived in their homes. I lived, I sat up under their, their table. I saw him go to work every day, all day long. I saw my grandfather go from poor church to a poor church, to a poor church, building him up and moving on to another poor church and building him up again to another poor church. I saw him go year after year, day after day, and every time you talk to him, he's praising his God. He never got too tired, never got too weary, never got too many problems to deal with. He would always have time to stop and tell you about his Jesus. I saw that, and it stuck with me. Then I saw my father, my mother's husband, took me and my brother out of St. Louis, spent all of my life chasing me and pushing me up on this pulpit. His fault. I saw him go day after day after day after day, tired, worn out, but always enough energy to tell you about his Jesus. So therefore, 
on that testimony alone, I decided to give that Jesus one more chance to go look for him. Now, I didn't know. I hadn't read enough to know that if you seek, you're going to find. I didn't know about that. I didn't know. He's, you know, if you seek, you'll find. And one day, in my intellectual mindset, see, I got to figure this God stuff out. The God will find you where you are. I'm, I'm intellectual. I'm, I'm researching. I got to look this up. And I go, and I'm, I'm driving up the freeway from San Diego to Oakland, California, late at night. I make that trip twice a month. And I'm driving up, analyzing all these things I had studied and read and understood. And it came down to some basic facts, folks. In spite of my racist hatred, folks, I want you to know that I have problems in my heart. Have I ever seen this guy again? I, don't, I didn't care where he was. He could have been in front of the police department. It, it didn't, he could have been in church. I didn't care why I saw him. I knew. I had promised myself every morning waking up in pain, every night going to bed in pain, taking drugs just to go to school and learn, couldn't walk, couldn't talk, couldn't ride a bicycle, couldn't swim anymore. I had, prom I had made a promise to myself. When I laid my eyes on him again, I was going to go to jail. I was going to go to jail. I hated him with a burning fire. At the same time, I'm looking for this Jesus. I didn't know they had a conflict coming here, folks. I didn't understand here. And I'm driving up the freeway, and these thoughts, these, this analysis start coming to my mind that either the disciples lied or they saw something that changed their, their mind, changed their heart. They saw so they witnessed something in history that changed their, their very character. They saw a raised Savior. They saw someone that they knew had recognized and saw him die, saw him buried, saw him raised up again. I had to make a choice in my life. I had to make a choice. It, it became clear to me in my hatred. It became clear to me that, that the creator of the universe, as the pastor said last night, the voice came to earth born of woman just for me. Just for me personally. Just for Mason. That the creator of all I can see and hold allowed sinful man to manhandle him and beat him and spit on him just for me. When I realized what, what Jesus had done, and he went to that cross, allowed his precious body to be nailed to that cross just for me personally and individually, that he allowed his sin-free sin body, his holy, precious blood, to drain on that cross and soak that ground just for me. When I realized that he had went into the grave, came out of the grave, leaving the captives free, and went to heaven just for me, when he would return just for me, something had to happen in me. What happened? When I realized that Jesus Christ did not compromise with Mason Weaver on the cross, I realized I could no longer compromise with him in the earth. No more compromising. I went home and told the world's most beautiful woman, marry me or leave me. Either play me or trade me. You're interfering with some blessings I got cut my way. I have to accept you a certain way. You can either change your last name or change your address. Now, she didn't know what happened to me on that trip. She was a little scared. She didn't understand. She said, that's my line. <laughs> no, I have to thank God for putting you in my life. I got to accept you his way by giving you the most, the most valuable thing I have, my last name. Now, I'm going to talk to you fellas for a second here. Fellas, you happily married men, you got to start bragging on your marriage to single men. You got to start telling them. You got to start telling them. You happily married, now you unhappily married men, just be quiet and sit down and shut up. We're going to fix you later. That's something you're doing. But you happily married men had better start bragging to single men about your marriages because single men only hear by marriage from unhappy married men. Because happily married men are too busy at home being happy. We can't share it with them. We owe it because for the reason why, because happily married men are happy because they're warriors and their wives are rewarding them for their warriorship and we need more warriors on the front lines with us. So you women 
have got to start choosing warriors so we can make the community stronger. You got to start choosing men worthy to be the father of your children. You got to start choosing them on the purpose of their, of their godliness, their protectiveness. Ladies, please help us with this. You got to stop picking men who lie the best. You know they lie. Good men, you make them your friend. Let's be friends. Good men are boring to you. Good men are no challenge to you. I got news for you, folks. I'm a good man. I will not go out and challenge the world for you and come home to be challenged by you. We have got to start choosing, and men have got to start making it uncomfortable for these guys to take advantage of the women in our lives. We've got to make it uncomfortable for men to go up and date your sister and misuse your aunt and take advantage of your little girl down the street. We have to make it uncomfortable for them. We can't, but we, you know, it's hard. We can't make it uncomfortable for other men. We're doing the same thing to their sisters and daughters. So as a young man, when I finally realized who I was and what I had to do in my life, something clicked in my mind. First off, this hatred I had, this artificial, fake, phony hatred that I had, I had to transform it to something else. Now, I didn't sit around and demand that this man apologize to me for throwing this steel plate on me. I didn't wait for him to say he was sorry. I didn't wait for a letter of apology. I had to forgive him. Folks, Christ had forgiven me. He had raised up for me. I was a new creature. I was no longer my own. Therefore, the attack on me was not on me. It was on my God because I belonged to my God. Therefore, he didn't owe me an apology. It wasn't between him and me. I had to forgive him first, first, folks. I had to place in my heart the thought that if I ever saw him again, I would still embrace him, but I would embrace him and tell him about the loving, kind, forgiving heart of my Lord and Savior. I would have to embrace him and tell him that God has forgiven him for his hatred of me. He should forgive himself of his hatred for me. He should learn the peace and joy that I have in my heart and leave that foolishness alone. That hatred, folks, will blind you and drive you crazy. What I learned was that my hatred for him was heavier on me than 2,800 pounds. It was crushing the life out of me. I couldn't function. You know, I went back for my Berkeley reunion. I was going to go back. Berkeley has 35,000 students when I was there. I could not remember the name of one white person. Now, how can you go to school with one of the best scholars in the world and not know the name? That's hatred, folks. That's, that's just honorary hatred. I had to forgive him and wipe that away, and then I began to look at myself, my culture, my race, my people, and begin to understand what happened to us. Why were we, why are we so fixated with all these emotions? You know, what happened to brought us out of out of slavery, out of freedom into slavery. What happened to the world? I began to notice something about my God. He's consistent. God is consistent, folks. You want to know how to get restored? Get recommitted. You know, if, if you're restored, you want to be restored, the very word means that you're going to have to go and get back what God has already stored up for you. So why, has, why have you lost what God has stored up for you? God is consistent, folks. You, Nobody can take anything from God, so no one took it from God. If you don't have it any longer, if someone took it from you, then that means that something in your life has made you vulnerable to theft. Vulnerable to theft. Someone has taken, you must be recommitted. You must go back and, and admit, and then commit, and then submit. We have to understand who we are. Folks, if we are free in Christ, then why are we so enslaved to debt? I don't understand. If, if we're free in Christ, why is it that the, the divorce rate is twice as high for Christians than non-Christians? If, if we are so committed, then, then why is it that, that we are the weakest, we're outvoted, we're outmaneuvered at every turn? I'm saying perhaps it's something that we are doing or not doing in order to serve our God better. You know, God is consistent, folks. 
If you have not done what God requires you to do, you're not going to get what God has for you. You're not going to get it. I had to learn that. And when I finally accepted that, that I had to still be a warrior. I was still aggressive. I'm still, I'm still militant, folks. You know, I wear my little cross on the plane in case somebody want to find a Christian to fool with. They need to find me. I, I ran for office in San Diego, and I started every campaign speech by saying, my name is Mason Weaver, and I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The press got all nervous. They got all nervous. Mason, why do you keep bringing up that God stuff? Don't you know separates of God, church and state and separates? Mason, stop all that God stuff. What's wrong with you? I was at a press conference once, and this dirty, unwashed reporter asked me a question about my God. First off, I don't let another warrior use my sword against me. I don't allow it. He wants to know why am I always talking about God? Do I know about the separation of church and state? I said, have you not heard the good news? Has no one not told you yet? The, the cross is empty. The tomb is empty. He has risen. Nothing belongs to Caesar any longer, folks. It's all mine. It's all mine. Nothing belongs to Caesar. We are in charge now, folks. We have to understand who we are as a people, understand our power. You know, faith is a verb. It is not a noun. It's not something that you're thinking about doing. It's not something that you are. It's something you are doing based on your belief in the word of God. You don't have to tell me how faithful you are. I should find out by the dust you're rising in the community, the things you're doing. You know, the people of God have always had to act first on the word of God before the miracle came. You're waiting for a miracle. What are you doing about it? You know, you believe God, but you don't act like it. You know, you stand up there and you wonder why God has not opened up the Jordan River yet. I'm going to tell you why. You haven't started walking. You haven't started walking. The priest stood there with hundreds of thousands of people behind him. God said, walk. And the closer they got to it, the wider it looked, the deeper it looked, the higher the waves were. But God said, walk. And they had to walk. And the miracle didn't happen until their feet touch the water. You're too afraid of the water now, folks. You're too afraid of the water. Walk. And the devil will tell you how deep and wide, how impossible it is. It's an illusion to get you paralyzed in your fear. Get up and walk and act like you believe you're a God. The victory is ours. The people of Israel got to the promised land and went to the, to the walls of Jericho. Higher. And the people inside was afraid of their God. The people inside already knew about the power of their God, feared their God, but still resisted their God. And they stood there, and, they, and God said, walk. Faith, walk. Faith into action, folks. Walk. And they walked until the walls came tumbling down. You don't do a miracle. You sit back and watch God do the miracle for you. Faith, folks, I heard it explained one day like, like a great tight rope walker came to town once. We're all famous. And he came, the whole crowd came out to see him, and they were cheering and clapping and acting crazy. You know how we do. We get there, and the man climbed up this 150-foot ladder with his tight rope across this expansion. He said, who believes that I could walk across this rope? And they all cheered. You're the greatest. You're the best. You're one of them. We believe it. He said, who believes it enough to think I can walk across this rope walking with a wheelbarrow? We believe it. We believe it. He said, who believes it enough to climb up here and sit in the wheelbarrow? <laughs> you see, folks, the climbing up is your faith. The sitting there is your belief. But the climbing up and sitting in that wheelbarrow is your faith. And I want to know, where is your faith? Where is your faith? And it has to be against something looking bigger and better than you. Because the action of a faithful man will destroy the stronghold of the enemy. The action of a faithful man, not the beliefs, but the action based on your beliefs supported by your confidence. So you come up and you saw little David. By the way, folks, in case you don't know it, God only used busy people. He didn't have time for lazy folks, neither do I. God uses busy people. He calls you while you're busy. So I don't want to hear about how busy you are. I want to know how faithful you are about what you're doing. Here's little David on his way, taking care of his father's business, on his way to do a little errand before he go back to those fields, taking that sheep, and he hears this giant walking back and forth in front of the people of God, 
blast with his God. And David said, I have a minute. Anybody got any rocks? I got a minute here. I'm going to take fire. I heard the man got a couple of brothers. And David said, I'm going to kill you. Folks, a baby will destroy Goliath. Anyone that walked out on the word of God would have destroyed Goliath. But everyone else looked at the size of Goliath and forgot about the size of their God. And he wondered, we wondered. Folks, if, if David had not walked out there, I believe that the Israelites would still be standing on the hillside right now waiting for somebody to destroy Goliath. And in our lives, we are waiting. God is waiting on us to believe what he said and act like it. We have, folks, we have 6,000 years in this Bible of God keeping every promise he has made. 6,000 years. How many more would it take for us to believe the ones for us? He has truly set aside a time for us. You want to be restored? I have news for you. You know, it's sitting there waiting for you. Just get up and go get it. It's an act of faith, folks. Just get up and go get it. Freedom, freedom is a choice. Freedom, I mean, the gates are wide open now. It's okay to leave the plantation, but Master won't tell you about that. It's okay to leave, but he would not let you know that. David, you know, David was, was a man of God's own heart. Here's David, man. He goes off the battle in, in, in 1 Samuel chapter 29, chapter 30. Judges, he goes off into battle, comes back and finds the enemy has taken everything he has, his wives, the possessions of all his army, and they are so angry at him, they want to stone him. He's upset and scared. Lord, what am I going to do? The first thing David did was to go to God and ask, do you want me to go back and get them? Should I go after them? First thing he did was admit they took my, my weapons, they took my women, my wives, my children. Then he submitted to the word of God, and then he acted in faith. And David went out and took back what God had restored to them. He took back every possession. God said basically to David, David went to God and said, they've taken everything, the people are going to stone me, they're taking my possessions, my wives, my children, our land. What are we going to do? And God said, that's your stuff. I gave you that stuff. That stuff is, is, is yours, David. Get and go get your stuff. Go get your stuff. Go and get your stuff, folks. It's your stuff. You sit around waiting. Should I get a U-Haul for you go get it for you? It's your stuff. God has given it to you. Jesus has died and raised up. The earth is ours. And we're sitting back waiting for someone to go get our stuff for us. I don't understand. He, it won't happen, folks. You look at Gideon. Gideon knew who God was eventually. He led 300 men against 135,000 enemy troops, trained enemy troops. Because God said, you don't need too many men. It's not fair. You got 300 men and me against 135,000 men with, with weapons. It ain't really fair, but we take them on anyway. My father said that one man and God equals a majority. Equals a majority, folks. Before I close, one thing about faith. What they did, 300 men with a circle around the enemy. He had them just what they wanted in the darkness with a light, a lantern, and a bugle. Each one had to break their lantern at the same time and blow their bugle to let them know where they were in case they couldn't find them. Had any man stood around that circle and said, I got to go and live for my wife. I can't go here. I got to go to the grocery store. I can't do this today. Had any man decided they were not going to show their faith, the enemy would not have been surrounded by the lights. And when they heard the bugle coming out, probably thinking each bugle was a division standard, each bugle was a division they were so confused that they had not seen the circle of lights, they could have saw a way to escape. But being surrounded by the people of God, they were so confused, they began to destroy each other. That's how our God works, folks. Folks, you work on miracles. He works on your faith. You have to get real, folks. You have to decide if you're going to be a slave or you're going to be a prisoner. See, a slave understands only one thing, to please his master. A slave thinks that the, the, his best quality is to get the best job on the plantation. The master, master, to manage master's lower 40 acres, to take care of master's children for him, to provide for the security of master so when master dies, his wife and kids live better because of their weight. That's a slave. Now, a prisoner is just captive. 
A prisoner has been caught. He knows he's a prisoner. He wants to get out. He's trying to find a way out. He will use every day of his life trying to dig his way out of his prison. You must decide if you are a prisoner or a slave. Because if you give a rope to a prisoner, he will thank you for it. He will tie knots in it. He will climb out that sucker and bring more of his friends with him. But you give a rope to a slave, he thinks you're going to lynch him. He resents you for it. He talks about you. Are you free or are you a slave? You can still be free and be in prison, but your God has freed you. The gates are wide open, folks. Just get up and walk. Don't ask master for permission. Just get up and walk. Your God is a free God, folks. Act like you're free. God is real. God is real. God is real. If you want what God wants for you, you better get real too. God bless you. to watch the broadcast of uh